Do you found the skeleton? How would you tell them that was us? You first, first. How would you tell us? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Kent with Bent 86, Dr. Hovind in the Creationism of Madness. Uh, by the way, I think this is uh, my occasional guest, Vishanti's least favorite thumbnail that I've ever made. So Why is that? Uh, well, she really likes Dr. Strange, and she really and does not like Kent Hovind, and conflating both, the two. Both rational uh, perspectives. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are here talking about uh, CSC 201 Class 7. CSC is uh, Christian Science Evangelism, and Kent Hoven claims that he taught at least a 101 and a 201 class for, quote, college credit. I can't imagine which colleges would college do that. College credit. But the title of this is uh, Does the Bible Match Evolution? But uh, before and... we get. He doesn't talk about evolution yet, or he hasn't yet, has he? Uh, he's talked about the age of the Earth a little bit. Okay. Which is... So, no. I mean, it's tangentially related. That's true. Um, Unlike everything else he was talking about, that is tangentially related. True. <laughs> um, so, let's see. Before we get into it, a few things you guys might have noticed, uh, or might not have, that uh, Erica got sick given... Dr. Dan from Creation Myths and myself all dropped videos simultaneously today on a similar topic. Uh, I do encourage you to go check those out after this. Do be warned, though, that Erica's is almost three hours long, so... I wouldn't call it a warning. I would call it, get your popcorn ready, because... Right. The first 40 minutes? Where am I at? The first 39 minutes and 51 seconds are great so far. Yeah. I think I've seen all of it, and I think it's all great. I also but really so like Dan's. Gabbers and so is Dr. Dan's. Oh, there you go. Um, and also, <clears throat> uh, that's probably going to be... I, I, okay, I don't want to lie and say it's our final word on the topic ever. But it's at least going to be our last word on that topic for quite a while. I, I don't think any of us have plans on addressing this topic for quite some time. So... Yes. Finally know who Donnie is. And yes. yes, he is out of his element. <laughs> One a month, so don't worry, you'll be in there for next month. Um, yes, as DM Wing has it right, everybody sends some amniotes to welcome Kellera into the channel membership program. Um, let's see. Now, this is a reaction stream, right? Also, I'm getting a little bit of feedback from you, Vent. I don't know if you can raise your um, threshold or something. Yep. So Give this is a, a reaction stream, and uh, we also have it as a bit of a drinking game. So we're going to go through the drinking rules. Now, the first thing I want to say is uh, if you want to play along with alcohol, that's great. If you don't, that's also great to build it, drink responsibly, know your limits, and also, um, I mean, this is your warning. Don't go do that and then, like, I don't know, drive disfiguration, destruction of property to yourself or others that might result from playing the Kent with Bent drinking game. But... Here are the drink triggers, and Bent here is going to keep me honest by making sure that I don't miss any. First, we drink whenever Kent Hovind says something that's so stupid we just kind of have to. Because, I mean, quite frankly, we, we have to do that a lot. Um, whenever also he gets something that is right without it just being a quotation from someone else, we'll take a drink for that. We will take a drink. Uh, one thing is, whenever Godzilla shows up, however, I think I might have left... The Godzilla triggering device in the other room. So, uh, we might have to fix that in just a bit. So, let's see. We will also, uh, there's, we'll also take a drink whenever Kent Hovind tells a story that didn't happen. Whenever he mentions the National Socialist German Workers Party, its various uh, leaders or big names and their various activities in like the 1930s and 40s. <clears throat> oh, Nathaniel Gray who's been a member for three months at the Tetrapod level, left us another drink trigger. So this is the Ghidorah emoji. So just like uh, if Godzilla or Mothra come by audibly, my members can super chat, and if they do so with one of the three kaiju emojis, we take a drink for that. We'll take a drink right now. And um, there is another drink trigger that can happen if you guys want to, uh, well, pay for it, because honestly, if I gave you guys free drink triggers, I feel like you might kill me. So, I, I can't do that. But that is... We that tested if, that with Bob Knopf. 
Okay, so <clears throat> I have forgotten the Godzilla device. Uh, but if you could do me a huge favor and describe for the people the um, the emoji, or not the emoji, the AIG. And so <clears throat> but you can rephrase it in a different way because they don't like the phrasing of that. Uh, and then there's also predictions. Did we talk about predictions yet? When I make a prediction and it comes true, we take a drink. Or when Dapper does it. And then uh, bad jokes. Yes. When Kent Hogan tells a, a joke. a joke that Kent makes that, that doesn't land, and that means no one laughs. If I laugh, Dapper laughs, or anyone in whose crowd laughs, it doesn't count. But otherwise... Right. Take a drink. Uh, you take a drink. And I laugh at some pretty awful dad jokes. <laughs> um, we have a couple super chats to get through real quick. Goopdo3 for $2 says, plays Kent with Bent and then drives a, and <laughs> drives a car. Yeah, no, bad idea. Do not do that. Uh, I mean, if you're just listening audio only. No, but plays Kent with Bent, I'm pretty sure, implies that he's doing the drinking game. Oh, that game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't do that. Well, look, if you're drinking the way I drink... You're drinking water or tea or coffee, and you just have to make a lot of bathroom stops. That's all. But don't drink and drive, please. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, real quick, Nathaniel Gray says, "Did my super chat come through for five dollars?" Uh, I'm not seeing a five dollars super chat, Nathaniel Gray. I'm only seeing the um membership milestone chat with Ghidorah. Sorry about that. Um. If it was from a very long time ago, then it might have um, been erased from the viewer activity from a very long time ago. Uh, for 100 Argentinian pesos, I finally remember what that is. I've, I've, it took me a long time. Tectonic says, this must be more ceremony. We've been already at this for longer than we normally are before we hear from Kent. So, um, let's do it. You ready? I was born ready, but no. I mean... I was not born ready, but yes. Okay. Well, here we go. Uh, we just had Kent tell us about a <clears throat> a mammoth that had two parts of it radiocarbon dated to different ages, except, well, it was two mammoths, not one. Older than the leg. It doesn't work. One. Yeah, like we said last time, it doesn't work, except it was two different mammoths, so it... It does work. Part of a mammoth dated 29,000 years old, another part dated 44,000. Another part but of I, a different mammoth. Right. To point out something that ought to be kind of obvious here. Both numbers can't be right. N no, they can. Because it's two different mammoths. Would you agree? No. It oh, wait, hold on. We, we, so this isn't a drink trigger, but it is sort of a rule. Whenever Kent Hoven asks his audience something, I ask my audience that thing. So we'll say, uh, we'll do a poll. And the question will be, would you agree that... Mm, let me just spell check that slightly a little bit. All right. Oh, wait, wait, don't, don't, need, don't need to add an option. Yes or no, we're fine. Um, there you go. That is a poll now. So feel free to uh, vote in the poll. This question reminds me of a question from a TV show called The Office. Oh. Um, I can't remember how it was phrased, but one of the characters... Oh, you know what? It doesn't really matter. It's too much of a tangent anyway, and I can't remember the line. But, uh, yeah, just never mind. Then. Okay, well, here we go. Can't be both 29 and 44. So... We know one of the numbers is wrong, right? No, I'm just going to take a drink. Right? How would you know either of them are right? Well, that's actually a really good question. Um, so <clears throat> let's actually say that we did get this problem, right? Because it's actually not completely impossible that you could get incongruous radiocarbon dates out of a single uh, find. So, for instance, um, it probably wouldn't be with, like, whatever he said, like the side and the leg or something, it would probably be something like um, like gut contents and the body of the animal might give different radiocarbon dates. <clears throat> and so the first thing that you will look for is, is there a reason why a particular portion might have an older radiocarbon date? 
And there are actually some reasons why this might be the case. So for instance, like I said, with gut contents, there are certain organisms that tend not to have access to what's called fresh carbon. And that basically just means carbon that has uh, been absorbed by a plant from the atmosphere within a very like short fraction of a half-life. And by that, I mean like decades, right? So the way that the carbon cycle usually goes for life is that organisms get carbon from the atmosphere, well, plants. I'm still getting that echo. Is there any anything we can do about that? I don't know. I can change it even further. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, yeah, so plants absorb carbon um, from the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. And most of that, you know, is going to be carbon-12, but some of it's going to be carbon-13, which is, or sorry, carbon-14, um, which is the radioactive isotope in question. And then animals eat the plants, and that usually only takes, you know, like a few months at most for that carbon cycle to go through. And then those animals will be eaten by other animals, and then eventually when an animal dies, it'll be eaten by, like, um, you know, decomposers and scavengers and things. And all of this usually doesn't take much more than like a few decades, which on the scale of time that carbon-14 decays, it's basically nothing. <clears throat> However, there are some environments where that's not the case. So for instance, um, marine hard-shelled organisms are often getting carbon that's filtered down through the ocean for, in some cases, you know, it can be a, it can be a really long time. And so for that reason, things like marine mollusks are known to be what's called carbon reservoirs, and they get old carbon and therefore they have unusually high radiocarbon dates. Another thing that's a possibility is um, organisms that live near roads tend to get old carbon because a lot of the carbon that the plants are absorbing is already old carbon from fossil fuels. So if there's less carbon-14 to be absorbed, the plants absorb less of it, animals absorb less of it, so they get um, higher radiocarbon dates. So recent, recently dead animals from near roads and things like that they could give you a not anonymously old carbon dates. So for instance, if an animal, like say, <clears throat> we won't use a mammoth because they're not around now, but let's say you had a bison, right? So you had this bison and it's growing up out in like the depths of uh, Yellowstone National Park, right? Where pretty much relatively low pollution from uh, vehicles and no particular marine carbon reservoir effect. So eh, no big deal. Okay, so let's say that sometime around, say, it's puberty. For some reason, it ends up living much closer to a main road, a relatively high traffic road. And so now it's starting to eat things like grass and stuff from right where the cars are driving by with their older carbon. Well, during this time, this animal is going to be laying down additional layers of things like calcium and stuff on its bones. And so it is at least feasible that you could test different parts of a bone and get different carbon uh, isotope ratios in different samples. And that would actually be a reason why. And I'm going to read a couple super chats. <clears throat> Blues Winters for $5 says, I don't know if you're familiar with the band Ailstorm, but, quote, your pirate ship can eat an AIG. <laughs> your pirate ship can eat a big fat AIG. We're going to count that. Take a drink. Carrie Bronson for $5 US says, when Eric went over this talking point, he made a joke about quote, slow birth, which kind of landed. Apparently the joke was original content. Wow, well, Eric Hovind having original content is a rarity, so good job to Eric. Um, So, let's say we do get an anomalous uh, discrepancy in our carbon dating for an animal. So what do we do? Well, there's a few things. One is you can take a look at, say, the sediment in which it was buried. See if you can test other organic debris that might be in there. So this animal was in permafrost. Well, <clears throat> permafrost also has a lot of other things like plant spores and things like that. So you can check that. Another thing you could do is look for, say, bits of wood and see if you can um, identify them using dendrochronology. See if you can check other uh, radiometric dating techniques. See, all of these are things that you can do to help figure out if you have a weird number What's the real um, thing that's going on? We're going to get more Kent. Is there any possible way to know that either number is right? If yes. You, yes, like we just went over. Getting two numbers from the same critter, you got to stop and think. 
either you got a really slow birth here. It took him, you know. Uh... Oh, <laughs> it wasn't original to Eric. Oh, <laughs> let's see if this joke lands because this is definitely a joke. What, 15,000 years to finish being born? Or. Nope, didn't land. We'll take a drink. If Kent laughs. You laughed, though. Well, I didn't laugh at the joke. I laughed at the fact that it wasn't Eric. Yeah, I know, I know. That's why I took a drink, but still. Fair enough. I could see why someone would take that interpretation. Mm. You're, you're, it doesn't work. Your carbon dating doesn't work. Maybe spend no. some of that 30 minutes a day just thinking. Spend that time thinking about why you might be wrong. I don't think Kent has ever done that. I, no, okay. So he's changed his mind on post versus premillennialism. And he did that while he was in prison. So I guess he has thought about being wrong and then decided that he was at some point. He's been pressured by his roommate. Oh, I hear a moth road. There we go. Sometimes in prison, your roommate can pressure you to do things that you might not want to do. <laughs> but I'm sure Ken knows all that. about that. In spite of all the theories, in practice, it doesn't work. Oh, Much more on that on video seven, question and answer, which will be two in about eight years at the rate we're going. Okay. Here's the evolutionist answer That's to true. the will be eight years at the rate we're going. Seriously. Finding magnetic strength. Wait, okay, so we're back to, to paleomagnetism, which we had talked about last time. I, this isn't as much whiplash as I get with uh, Matt Powell, who will just completely switch topics all the time. But Kent will do it too. He has no sense of how to like structure a talk so that it flows nicely, or how to do a segue between different topics. It's just nothing. Anyway. They know the magnetic field's declining. Never had an argument on this. You've had lots of arguments on it, but okay. So they'll say, well, there are magnetic reversals. So oh. this textbook says there's... Goodness. A lot of Mothra today. I blame Peter. You don't have your um, drink counter up. Oh, you're right. I don't even think we're it's at, on the scene. We're at 25. Uh, are we? No, that's probably 200. It's probably, probably. less than that. <clears throat> it's probably like 10. My goodness. Kent, what is the point of putting this up here if you're in such low res that no one can read it? By the way, guys, I this is it. It says Changlin and Stellarity of Rock on both idea of... You're right, I can't read it. <laughs> All right, here we go. Reversed polarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What they say is, as the ocean floor spreads, the magma comes up in the middle and the ocean mid-Atlantic ridge is spreading out, which is probably is true, kind of like a big conveyor belt, maybe. It's not probably is true, Ken. There are things like lasers measuring it in real time. We can get down to like the per atom spread rate, and it's about the same rate as your fingernails grow. Like... I, I love when he's like, and this is probably true. And when it's like, this is just the thing we can measure. Like, we know for a fact what this is. This isn't even a theoretical thing. It's like, how long is your table, Kent? That's not a theoretical question. It's a measurement question. We know that the continents are spreading apart at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And that the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is being pushed to either side by new lava form. Like, this isn't... Sorry, I... I just hate it whenever Kent Hovind's like, and this thing that we've definitively measured to be the case, I mean, it's probably true, I guess, maybe. Okay, Kent, thanks. Maybe true, run the numbers know. again. Okay. There, I ran them again. Guess what? Computer, man. Continents are still spreading, man. Think about that. But they'll say, as the magnetic field flips, it is recorded and preserved in these rocks, the paleomagnetism. It's locked into the rock. Hey, that was all true. I'm going to take a drink. And they show this alternating polarity, the bands. You know, you got the red bands and the gray bands. They say the polarity is going opposite direction. This is absolutely pure yeah, propaganda. Come up with better okay, band names than red band and gray band. <clears throat> also, uh, this is pure <clears throat> propaganda. Let's hear why this is pure propaganda. Because I'm pretty sure it's not, but maybe I'm wrong. Not true. We cover much more on that on video six, but... Uh, Walt Brown has a great section on his website, creationscience.com, about this phenomena. There is not, there are not magnetic reversals. Mm. What it was, it... Okay, so I want everyone to realize that <clears throat> people who measure this, right, they use devices called things like, you know, magnetometers that read positive and negative values depending on the direction of the field that you stick them in. So this isn't a question, right? 
we know for a fact that these reversals are there because you can measure them, and they don't just go down to zero, they go negative, they reverse direction. Uh, Nathaniel Gray says for $5, today's been bad, been irritated by a bunch of AIG analogs, been looking forward to the stream. Well, Nathaniel Gray, I am first sorry that it's been a rough day. Um, I know what that's like, man. There's been some, been some rough days lately. Yeah. I think that's going around. Uh, but I am really happy that this is helping. So, yeah. Same. It was stronger and weaker magnetism they were measuring. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a drink. One, for Kent just being completely wrong. And two, for this being a stupid argument. Okay, so the problem with this argument is that even if it is just stronger and weaker magnetism, it negates Kent's idea that the magnetic field of the Earth is just continuing to wane throughout history. So... <laughs> And somebody drew a line through the middle of this, called a sine wave, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down. And they drew a line through the middle and called everything below average a reversal. No, uh, they measure the direction because you can do that. That's just lines on paper. Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this, is, this is not like temperature, right? Where really all temperatures are... Like, there's no zero temperature which, under which you can realistically go. Yeah, there are negative Kelvins. But, like, that's a weird, complicated statistical phenomenon, and it's actually still hot. Like, it's hotter than zero Kelvin if you're at, like, negative three Kelvin. We're not going to get into it, because I don't fully understand it. I don't think Bent does. It has to do with, like... No, I don't fully understand it, but it has to do with... So, if, when something is <clears throat> hot, it'll give off energy to something cooler around it, but negative temperature won't do that. Yeah, it's... But it's still... The molecules are moving very rapidly, so they're hot by that definition, but they're not going to release their energy to nearby surrounding, I think. And I don't know how it works. I'm not sure either. I would look it up if I want to pretty, talk about It's it. pretty fascinating stuff. Yeah. Um, if only there was someone named Landon we could talk to. Again. <laughs> After so, like a, a Lyle Landon, maybe? So the thing is, the zero point on the temperature scales that most people okay. use in everyday life, like Celsius or Fahrenheit, those are arbitrary levels, right? There's nothing zero about zero Celsius or zero Fahrenheit. They're just picked as reference points. Now, the Celsius zero reference point has a fairly convenient uh, value. It's the value at which ice freezes, which is convenient for humans. So, I mean, it's not arbitrary in the sense that, like, there isn't a good reason for it, but it is arbitrary in the sense that it could be anywhere and it wouldn't really change how things go. But the direction of magnetic lines of force are not the same, right? Like, they can have a strength, but they also have a definitive direction. They can point in one way or the other. And when they point in the other direction, you can tell. It's not a question that you have to ask. And, uh, yeah, they point in other directions. They don't just get weaker with an arbitrary zero line. That's not how Something magnets you can work. measure. Right. Look. I, I believe with a compass. But um, I don't know if they're actually strong enough. It might be true that you can... They might not be. Um, so here's the thing, right? This is, you can't just draw an arbitrary zero line. Like, you can measure this. So here we go. If we lined up everybody in, you know, Pensacola mm -hmm. and found the average height is five foot six. Okay, again, height doesn't have a vector, Kent. So Kent is just basically confusing vectors with scalar units, right? This is a, it's actually a fairly basic mistake, but I mean, people make it. So it was pronounced scalar. Maybe it's scalar. I could be wrong. I don't know. I, I'm going to go with scalar for now. I'm going to Google it. Okay. I might be scalar. Anyway, so some units don't have a directionality to them, right? Like speed. Speed is just your distance over time. Who cares which way you're going? If you're going, you know, 100 kilometers an hour, one way and 100 kilometers an hour the other way, it's the same speed. Velocity, though, is quite different. Velocity has a vector. And that's why acceleration is not a change in speed, it's a change in vector. So, for instance, if you start banking to, on a right-hand turn while keeping a constant speed, you're still accelerating because you're changing your velocity. Now, height, which is just a length, right? It's given in units of length, like feet, meters, whatever. This does not have a vector. It's just 
a measurement. That's why you don't say, oh, I'm three feet up. You might say you're three feet tall or whatever, which, you know, I think the only person here who meets that would maybe be Chesh, but, you know, most of us are probably more than three feet tall. So I, I guess, what, what's a good human height? Like five and a half feet tall, six feet tall? We'll go with six. Like we'll go with six for a human. I think that's tall for a human. It's not tall for a me, but whatever. I think the I think heard like the average male height in America maybe might be like five foot nine and a half or five foot ten or something like that. Hmm. Well, that's close but, to six, so we'll go with six. I so, used to be taller <clears throat> than average. Now I'm not. We'll say six shorter. or two meters. So yeah, you don't have to specify a direction. For instance, your height doesn't really change if you lie down. Right? Like, no one's like, oh, well, you were two meters tall, but then you lied down, so now you're only, you know, like, 0.2 meters tall or something. That Like, that's not how that works. But magnetism has a directionality, and the easy way to do this is just, if you've ever used a bar magnet, you'll notice it has two sides, and they don't act the same. It's got a north and a south side. And that's because of the vector nature of magnetic lines of force. So let's keep going with Kent being bad at magnets. Because you know what? How do they work? Okay. Does that mean anybody who's under five foot six is reversed, i.e., down in the ground? No, Kent. But again, you're mixing up two fundamentally different kinds of measurements. Or does it mean they're just lower than average? Yes, it means that. It doesn't mean they're reversed and sticking down in the ground, okay? It just means they're lower than average height. That's all it means. And so Congratulations, Kent. You found a bad analogy to intentionally mislead people. So areas of weaker magnetism does not mean it is reversed. He covers in his website uh, and on his videotape that he did, which is great, on probably when the, earth, when the fountains of the deep broke open, well, the, ma the basalt, there's a layer of rock. You know, he'll, he'll complain about scientists using words like, it seems, we suppose, might have... And then he's like, well, probably, you know, some lava broke open. Okay, Kent. If it's... you just never say anything that's really falsifiable, then how can you be falsified? Yeah, you can. I think that's what he's trying to do, at least. The <laughs> granite rocks of the crust of the earth. Then there was a layer of water and then a layer of basalt, which is... Ah, water and then basalt. Okay, so this is the hydroplate theory. Um, I want to remind everyone... That the hydroplate theory results in um, something like an amount of heat roughly equivalent to about 77 atomic bombs, like Hiroshima-level atomic bombs, per person who has ever lived in the entire history of the world being released over the course of the flood year. Um, yeah, it's not a feasible model. It's just physically not a feasible model. Noah wouldn't have needed an ark to survive. He would have needed a spaceship and to be off of Earth, and pretty far away too, because Earth would be uh, blasting the entire solar system with intense EM radiation. I really want to see this movie yeah. where Noah builds an ark and then all the flood stuff happens, but then the ark just goes into space. <laughs> and then Neil Green shows up and yeah. Tommy Wiseau's there. Yeah, we we video. do need a Tommy Wiseau, Ooh. Neil Breen mashup movie. This could be the, the perfect vehicle for it. Uh, All right, yeah. here we go. Hardened lava, okay. As the basalt would bulge up, it would crack. How did you get hardened lava on top of water, Kent? It's right. made of copper. Oh. Copper magma. You try to bend a rock, eventually it's going to crack. Water's going to rush into those cracks and cool it off. The basalt... Wait, cool what off, Kent? The basalt that's already hardened? What? All right, fine. The basalt is, you know, close to the uh, Moho or Visic discontinuity, the place where it changes over to a... You said it was over the water. If the water is under the basalt that's near the Moho discontinuity, it's, also, it's going to be hotter than the basalt. We're not thinking seventh dimensionally, okay? I'm, I'm taking a drink for can't get the first thing about thermodynamics right. Well, now that we know that instead of water, we're actually already shooting superheated, uh, super critical steam, I don't think we're going to be cooling anything down. Is it plasma yet? Um, not at that point. Okay. Liquid not in the yet. center of the Earth or toward 
actually, by the time they all crack and break up, that might actually be enough gravitational potential energy to actually ionize some of the uh, water. Okay, gravity's real, sure. <laughs> Good point. For the center. Well, the bulging basalt would crack, and the water's going to rush in, cooling it down along the cracks. Except, according to you, the water would have to be hotter than the basalt, Kent. It can only heat the basalt up. Like, does Kent Hoven think that water is made of cold? Like, is that what's happening right now? Well, if you look back at the Hovind theory, all of the water came from one large comet. Okay. And that was cool. So, hot rock does not store a magnetic field. Um, that's basically the case. So, what happens is that when rock that contains iron is molten, the iron atoms are basically free to orient themselves. And so they tend to do so along the currently con existing um, mag magnetic lines. So on Earth, you know, that's a geomagnetic field. Um, as it cools, though, <clears throat> obviously they get locked into place. So that preserves both the strength um, and the direction of the field. So what happens is, in weak fields, the atoms only weakly align. And in strong fields, they strongly align. And then you can use the direction in which they aligned to determine which direction the fields were going when the rock was formed, when it cooled. So I, Kent's kind of right about that, so we'll take a drink. Like, there's more to it than he went into, but, like, he still basically got the idea right. If you put a magnet in your oven and heat it up, it'll lose all of its magnetism. Not all of it necessarily unless you heat it hot enough but yeah you can heat a magnet enough that it will lose its magnetism so you know what we'll take a drink for that too i'm being generous i did not know as that. it gets warm so what they were measuring was where the cracks were probably from the fountains of the deep breaking open how does probably how, how kent how does that make sense how does cooling already solid basalt with water that's hotter than the basalt cause you to get changes in the observed amount of magnetic flux, according to you, passing through the rock when it cools. Great question. Next question. Fair enough. That's one for the scientists to figure out. Um, he's got the solution. The scientists have to figure out how, how he got there. It just kind of like, so like day sense. 40, we're, we're out of debt. Day 39, okay, let's work <laughs> our way back. <clears throat> go on, guys. Figure it out. Yep. All right, here we go. And they were measuring stronger and weaker magnetism based on the magnetic signature found in the rocks at the bottom of the ocean. Which, again, no, because like I said, you can tell the directionality, too. You don't have to just draw an arbitrary line. It's true there are different intensities, but it's not true that there are reversals. In incorrect. How they did that, I don't know. That's part of the Pangea theory. How many of you Oh, Ken. <laughs> I love it that Kent's like... This measurement is totally invalid. It's not what they say it is. Now, I don't know how you would take a measurement of this kind, but I can, trust me, bro, it totally wasn't what they said it was. They're just lying to you, even though I have no idea what's going on. Ever heard of Pangea? Textbooks will teach, oh, yes, boys and girls, millions of years ago, all the continents fit together. I mean, they do still kind of fit together if you cut them out like puzzle pieces. Right? They don't ever tell the kids. They had to shrink Africa 35 to 40 percent to make them fit. That's because it's not true. I mean, look, you can just do this on Google Maps or Google Earth, right? You can get a fixed distance from the Earth, take a screenshot of uh, South Africa or South America, sorry, and then scroll over to Africa, take another screenshot, and then just look at them. Now, do the coastlines match up precisely? Well, no. Because, you know, there's been uplift and erosion since Pangea. But it's this is just a lie. And all it takes to debunk is just Google Earth. That's it. I'm taking a drink. So, isn't there, like, a way that maps can be drawn that kind of exaggerate, um, I think, at the poles? Oh, it, yeah. That can make it look like it's much different? So, all but flat if maps... If you look on an actual globe... <clears throat> mm -hmm. Well, there are so many different types of... So all flat uh, maps distort maps. some kind of measurement. Some of them distort 
area, some of them distort length, some of them distort both, some of them distort angles. It's impossible to unwrap a sphere onto a flat surface without causing some distortion somewhere. Weird, because if the Earth is flat, then why would it matter? Well, not <laughs> flat after good point. All. So, right. yeah, um, this is just a straight up lie. It's just not true. Why wouldn't they bring that up? Because it's not true, Kent. At it's... best, Kent, it's you misunderstanding maps. Yeah, that's the be- that's a, the most charitable interpretation. Is Kent Hoven looked at a flat map projection and said, "Oh, hey, these don't actually fit together because South America is too big." That's not even happening. Or he too at small. Maps I don't know. And he's like, "I'm going to pick this one where it doesn't fit and say that's the real map." Yeah. Maybe, That's the King James map. You know, Kent Hoven says title. he isn't a flat earther, but this argument really only makes sense from a flat earther. Maybe he is a flat earther. Hmm. I really do. Like, I think that if he were, like, an up-and-coming creationist right now, he'd be a flat earther. Because, I mean, look, if you want to be like, oh, I'm going to take Genesis super literally, I, I mean, okay, those floodgates in the dome of heaven, this firmament, the thing that's firm and solid... I mean, yeah, that sounds an awful lot like, a lot like the dome over the flat Earth. Well, we don't want to confuse the kids, you know. Oh, you don't want to present the facts because you want them to believe your theory. Is that the way this goes? Okay. That's a conversation that didn't happen, so we'll take a drink. Well, that's just more projection. <clears> hmm. <throat> True. They don't tell them that Mexico and Central America are gone. It's first. What? Okay, hold on. We, we need to look back at our the map that he gave us. Oh, hey, look. There's northern Mexico right there. This will teach. Oh, yes, boys and girls. Millions of years ago, all the continents fit together. Right? They don't ever... Well, we don't want to confuse the kids, you know? Oh, you don't want to present the facts because you want them to believe your theory. Is that the way oh. this goes? Okay. Yeah, I've never heard they don't of tell the them that Pangea Mexico and theory... As mm. a title of the theory. Yeah, it's weird. What all America are gone. Mm. Okay, I so studied it. Mexico isn't gone. However, southern Mexico isn't there, in part because um, new crust forms. What? Yeah, I mean that's that's it. That's all it. That's all it is. Yeah, new crust forms. Okay. Take a look at any map of Pangaea. Hey, señor, dónde está Mexico? Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala. Okay. Hey, Ken. Uh, if you're going to speak Spanish, even with a thick, thick American English accent, it's not Mexico, it's Mexico. ¿Dónde está Mexico? I mean, like... Ever, you are a cunning linguist. Thank you. Uh, okay. Right? They're gone. <clears throat> that map was obviously not an actual map of Pangaea. It was a... Let's take modern borders of modern continents and show how they were shifted around to give you an idea of if you can find, like, where you live, where where you live roughly was in relation to the other continents. Josh, you're going to be a missionary down there? Well, you couldn't have done it 200 million years ago. There, it was. I mean, yeah, that's true. Not, no, not so much because they weren't there as, like, there would be no one to evangelize to because there were no people. <clears throat> what are you going to do? Go up to a Moss Chops and be like, hey, Moss Chops. Uh, do you believe in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And then the moss chops would go like, and it would go eat some ferns. Because you know what moss chops doesn't care about? Anything about your religion. And guys, in case you don't know what moss chops is, I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, but that's because I want to, because moss chops sounds cool. But look up M-O-S-C-H-O-P-S. It's a fun synapsid. Uh, Carrie Bronson for $5. <coughs> Sorry, I'm says the only difference between flat earth and young earth is how good you are at geography. By that definition, Kent fulfills the criteria of a flurf. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's no Mexico, okay? Uh, they don't tell them that they twisted Africa clockwise and twisted South America counterclockwise. Yeah, that's the point of the plate tectonics, Kent. What? I've t- Taking a drink, I don't know. If the plates know. aren't moving exactly perpendicular to or parallel to any equator or any line that Kent wants to draw on any sphere, then they can't really be moving. Yeah. 
<laughs> I just Look, can't. How could Pangea one. form in six thousand years? It, besides the flood, it, it probably couldn't. That's a good. I still want to know. I still want to know why a global flood is necessary to cause a Grand Canyon, but there's only one Grand Canyon. Where are the rest of them around the globe? That's never made any sense to me. So, <clears throat> uh, Tiktaalik says that Mexico was Baltiful? It actually sounded so great. I'm not sure if those are the IPA symbols you wanted to use. But, uh, yeah, it, it Mexico is... is uh... Now, look, I'm not saying I have an amazing Mex or Spanish or Mexican-Spanish accent. I definitely do not. But um, I can at least get the basic form of the consonants right. Notice on the map, Africa and South America look about the same size. That's because they are. Well, okay, Africa's a bit bigger, but like the coastlines do are about the same size, like the east coast of Africa. Or west coast well. of Africa, east coast of South America. Grab that globe up there, would you, Albert, and toss that up here? Uh, I don't want to get my microphone wires messed up. You take a look at a globe. Go wire this. Not a map, okay, a globe where you get the actual scale. <laughs> Africa is huge compared to South America. Okay, so I guess we're just gonna we're just gonna do it. So um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Let's see what we can get. I'm checking on images. Uh, we have a five dollar super chat from Keller Italian who says, my sixth grade Earth science students have better grasp on plate tectonics than Kent with the Godzilla emoji. So take a drink. All right. Oh, hey, you know what? I just figured out we're, we're going to show something here. Okay, so uh, this is a picture of the, um, I believe it's the mole-wide map, which is the sort of basic classroom map that you get. And I'm going to be putting it up on screen in just a second. So give me a second while I adjust my OBS. Oh, nope, that's not right at all. Uh, there we go, and we're going to turn off there chat. There we go. Okay, so um, this is an example of a projection where, one, the equator is not centered on the up-down like, center of this map, and that is because uh, this map actually favors the northern hemisphere for like the majority of its area because it's also where the majority of the human population and the land is. Now, you can make arguments as to whether or not that's, you know, some kind of <clears throat> uh, Northern Hemisphere chauvinism. I don't particularly like this map either way, so, like, I'm not really going to fight you. I'm saying, no, it's not. It's totally appropriate. But that's how it is. But this uh, projection notoriously distorts the area of land masses. So, <clears throat> yeah, we got that problem. So let's see. Do, 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 do. We get a size comparison of South America and Africa. It's unfortunately not easy to do. I'm not getting a whole lot. Well, I'm um, see if he gets his globe. Oh well, you know what? Tossed up to him at his desk. We're gonna give up on that one. Sorry, guys. Uh, but yeah, they're. I mean, they they do fit together. Uh, here we well, go. and if one's larger than the other, it doesn't matter at all because as long as the part that needs to fit together fits together, who cares if one well, yeah, there's is that larger too. than the other? Yeah, that's I mean, a... that's how continents are right now. Some are larger than others. Mm -hmm. In fact, Africa is uh, pretty big. It's bigger than North America. All right, here we go. Everybody, pass that around in a second here. South America. Oh my right goodness, here. hold on. About I missed a message from Ben Hoven, who's been a member for 25 months at the Tetrapod level, who says AIG is a bag of pens with some Mothra emojis. I'm going to take a drink for that. Okay. Ooh. That far across, the bulk of it, mm -hmm. Africa is checking yes, in. That's, that's the part that's supposed to fit together. Yes, the middle the of the western, continents. The western part of, uh, I'm sorry, the eastern part of Africa. 
Yeah. The, the Amazon basin is just supposed to be dumped on the middle of Africa. Ugh, I'm going to take a drink. That was too stupid. I can't. I can't. That is pretty dumb. Take a look for yourself. It's just not logical to say. Just, how do they get by with this stuff? You know, where, where's somebody with a brain saying, oh, excuse me, wait a minute. I'm saying my hat doesn't fit. I can't put my hat on. So this is, this is one thing that always kind of puzzles me. Is Kent really suggesting that every single scientist out there, with the exception of the vanishingly small Young Earth Creationist group, and not even all of them, because most of them, in fact, do think that Pangaea was real. They just think it formed under the flood. Um, <clears throat> does he think that just none of them ever bothered to check, like, the length of the coastlines or the basic size and shape of the continents before they proposed this? Like, does Kent Hovind really think that Ken Ham and his crew were just like, no, nah, that's fine. Even though there's this glaring error. And every scientist who's, a, you know, like an actual scientist doing stuff like, you know, geology and earth studies and whatnot, they, they all were just like, uh, we skipped math that day. Because, I mean, that's the obvious implication. Either that or they're all just intentionally lying. So either there's a giant conspiracy involving essentially all of science, or all scientists caught the big dumb, or, Kent, maybe you should reconsider this argument. One, uh, the uh, textbook, uh, I forget where it was, in, in Texas, the uh, Gabler, Gablers caught it. But one of the textbooks they oh, tried to get uh, the to around. sell the text. Uh, maybe someone's going to crawl under the desk and grab it. He said he was going to pass it around. He just puts it away. Well, we weren't going to get it either way. I know, but the eight people in his class or whatever get it. That's true. Oh, by the way, I ended the uh, poll. We had, would you agree that two different radiocarbon ages for two different mammoths can be true? 90% uh, said yes. 9% said no. I guess 1% didn't vote. We got 62 votes. Texas had the equator... The equator yeah. going through Florida. Oh, okay. Wait. Does he mean on a Pangea map or? I, I feel like does, I'm, but I, I missed the first half of the sentence. Yeah, I'm gonna I go mean, back. If that was a while ago. I'm gonna go back a few cents, uh, seconds because I, I honestly don't know what he's trying to say here. Uh, we have five U.S. dollars from Caleb Sherstad. Nay, as they dare, I will bite my bag of AIGs at them. Which is a disgrace to them if they bear it. Nice. Take a drink. All right, here we go. Gabler's caught it. One of the textbooks they tried to get uh, to sell to Texas had the equator, the equator, going through Florida. This is uh, kids are going to learn this on a map, you know. Okay, kids, study your geography for tomorrow. Where's the equator? Goes through Florida. You're going to mess that kid up for the rest of his life. I can't figure out if he means... I mean, if they're teaching right now that the equator goes through Florida, sure, but I don't think that's what yeah, I can't, Pangea is on about. I can't tell if he means that this is supposed to be the case now, according to this textbook, or if it's supposed okay. to be that it was the case in Pangea. Because in Pangea, well, first, I mean, Florida didn't really exist, but, like, that area would have been, like, near the equator. So I, I just don't know. Well, well, maybe we'll figure it out if we play it more. One of the textbooks had uh, George Washington was Abraham Lincoln's vice president. Oh, only about 60 years different in time frame, you know. Kent, that's only one order of magnitude off. Your average is four to six. I don't think you get to complain about being 60 years off. I'm just going to put it out there. You know, I'm, I'm just going to drink. It is, it is right. It is a mistake. It is a mistake, but I'm just going to drink for Kent Hovind, of all people complaining that someone has a whole order of magnitude error. There we go. Oh. <laughs> no, he wasn't. George Washington. Oh, brother. But the Cablers, uh, textbookreviews.org. They've got... Re What's up? Sorry. Or was he trying to make a joke there? Oh, um... Either way, we took a drink. Yeah, yeah. Reviews of all kinds of textbooks showing just some unbelievable things that they're in there. Like, hello, does anybody have a brain out there? Like that uh, Ernest uh, movie... What was the one where he said, everybody works around here. Where he finally talks about Ernest evolution? Rob Wait, no, that's yeah. something else I'm thinking. Ernest talks about evolution because Ken Hoven won't. 
robs the bank or whatever it was. You know, Ernest goes to jail. That was it. That was hilarious. That's it like was hilarious. He's right. I'll drink to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, to be Everybody. fair, I don't remember any of it, but I loved it when I was a kid. <laughs> I remember loving Ernest Goes to Jail a lot. Works around here, a moron. Well, yeah, uh, they got to be morons. They, they made Africa the same size as South America. It is not. No, they, you know, we already covered it. Okay. Hey, Diane, make a note for me to find out how many square miles Africa is, and I'll stick that on the map. And how... It won't matter, Kent. The... <laughs> No one is saying that for two things to fit together, they have to be the same size. I just don't know where this is coming from. I know things can change, like you were saying, there just wasn't the land that is the southern part of Mexico or Central America that was still underwater at that point, or however you would phrase that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it, it would be at least closer if you just measured, like, maybe one coastline of one continent and then another coastline of another one not the random area off to the side of that well so yeah instead of getting square mileage just do uh just coastline well i'm going to do a quick demonstration of how it is that two things can fit together while being different in size you ready for this you might have to just watch the stream because it's not going to come through for you okay i'll just take so, many examples <clears throat> in my head this is blender okay now, I'm going to take this default cube here, I'm going to duplicate it, I'm going to scale it, and we're going to move it somewhere, and give it a little rotation, and then I'm going to add a bevel, or not bevel, a boolean modifier. We're going to go cubo one, difference, and then we're going to apply, also going to apply the location. Okay. Now... Look at this. There's a fun little hole in this cube that exactly matches this cube if I center its uh, location here. See? They're perfectly aligned. Oh my goodness, but this cube is so much bigger than this cube. How is this even possible, guys? I don't know. It must be witchcraft. You should probably all burn me at the stake. Where do you buy your cube art from? <laughs> <laughs> Sketchfab. I Like... This is just so baby town basic stuff that I, I don't even know what to do other than like, look guys, here it is. I solved the conundrum of how one continent can be bigger than the other, but they still stick together. DM, DM Wing for $5 says, Kent's brain is greater than all scientists' brains. Not a narcissist. Hashtag not a narcissist, sorry. With some Godzilla emojis, so we'll take a drink for that. Paleo Logo says, Dapper just made a model in 30 seconds that would take me 30 minutes. <laughs> Tell you what, Paleo Logos, if you want some some basic 3D stuff, let me know and I can help you out with that. It's it's a lot of fun and I like doing it, so like, feel free. And I can do it very quickly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right, here we go. Here's some more kids. Uh, and then after this, we're going to take our quick break. How many square miles all of South America is? Total square miles for each continent. And you In your Pangea map, nothing. they look the same size. They shrank when Africa. I, did you do volume instead? Did you measure the area on those Pangea maps, Kent? Did you actually sit there and do the calculus? No, of course you didn't. A lot. Just do a height map. Can... Just do height maps. Ooh, height maps. Do are other fun. random measurements. Other random unrelated measurements that have nothing to do with the point you're trying to make, Kent. This is just the dumbest thing. Fit. They also don't tell you what I think really ought to be obvious to a kindergartner, okay? Oh, uh, yes. The experts of the universe, kindergartners. Oh, man. Kent's reliance on kindergartners to fifth graders or five year olds or whatever it is is really weird to me. Out of the mouth of If you take the babes, water out of the oceans, Michael you will Scott, notice there is please. dirt underneath. The o- well, I mean, there's rock. And sediment, dirt, which is like used. Dirt. So dirt is sort of synonymous with soil, which is its own special thing that doesn't exist everywhere. There are places without dirt, but they do have earth under them. I've never sure, been that... to the, like the bottom of the ocean and the middle of the ocean, uh, but it's mostly. I had to guess. I I mean, look, when I go to the beach, I see sand. Kind of assume there's kind of sand, kind of stuff going on there with other rocks. I don't. What do yeah, I know? Yeah, the bottom of the ocean. How is... would I know? 
the bottom of the ocean is mostly uh, muck and sand and um, <clears throat> rock. Just technically and, ro really soil in the way you think of it as on land. And fascinating forms of life, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Actually have a, f a bottom to them, a floor, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what? Kent is right. The, the oceans aren't just deep abysses that go to the center of the Earth, like in that Naboo. go all the way through. Yeah, this isn't Naboo, so good job, Kent. There's no ocean tunnels of ocean that we've ever... Oh, can we also talk about that if the fastest way is to go through the literal center to get to the Naboo city, that means that the droids landed on the exact opposite side of the planet from where they wanted to go? Making Safer it so that way. There oh. was a planet blocking their approach. <laughs> okay. These continents are not lily pads floating around in a bathtub. Tests. That's true, okay. Ken. The Earth has a continuous solid crust. I am mostly continuous. Like you mentioned, it does have cracks, but the cracks are usually in contact with each other, so, eh, you know. There's also a lot and of so volcanoes erupting all the time. True. Talk to Landon about that. Recently. <clears throat> But somebody says to me, do you think the continents were ever connected? I say, what do you mean? They're still connected right now. Oh, my goodness. All right, we're going to explain this, then we're going to take a quick break. When people say the continents were connected, they do not mean that there was intervening oceanic crust between them in a continuous fashion. What they mean is that the continental crust was in contact between the continents, forming a supercontinent, kind of like how Africa and Asia are currently in contact or how the Indian subcontinent and Asia are in contact. Are you misunderstanding people's question? On purpose? Probably on purpose, yeah. It doesn't make it a bad question, and it doesn't mean that there isn't something that they're getting at that you're not helping them with. If you just snarkily misinterpret someone's question, that doesn't make you look smart, Kent. It makes you look like a jerk. And with that, we're going to take a quick intermission, and we will be right back after these messages. Right, and we are back. That actually was one of my faster um, 
we call these intermissions. So I call them bathroom breaks. Uh, that's fair. So this is the quick post intermission commercial, guys. This channel is a big passion of mine. I really love this channel, and I want to make sure that it can continue indefinitely. And the biggest way that anyone can help with that is by joining the channel or the Patreon. They start at a dollar a month on Patreon, and I think two bucks a month on the YouTube. And um, you get early access. There's more than two months worth of early access videos that you can get access to. Uh, there's a private Discord server just for people who are uh, supporting with that kind of pledge. Also on um, Patreon, you can get, I think it's like a 12% discount for an annual pledge. So, <clears throat> sorry, if you can afford it and you really want to, please head over there and uh, consider making a pledge uh, either on Patreon or join the channel right below. Um, it really, really helps. And um, if you can't or you just don't want to, that's fine too. But if you still want to help the channel, please hit like, share this, comment, do all that YouTube stuff because YouTube really does care. Okay, so uh, we have another super chat from GoodDo3, who says for $5, Kent is a personification of the Twitter meme that's like, nice try defending your point, too bad I made this meme where I'm handsome and you're ugly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kent often does just come down to, uh, you're a big meme poopoo head, so I win. It's like, oh, okay. I'm, I'm glad that we managed to get out of first grade, Kent. Right this minute, the continents are connected. It's just the low places are full of water. Yeah, Kent, that's not what anyone's asking. And it's honestly insulting for you to give that kind of response to people who are asking you a legitimate question. Right? Yeah, I mean, look, you can troll people with answers like that every now and then, but eventually you got to answer the question, you yeah. know? And I mean, especially if you're teaching students in, in high school or college, he didn't say he taught college. Video. Well, he, well he's claiming now, this I is guess, a college but... class. So, yeah, you can't do that, man. Yeah. Not connected. Duh. My house and the neighbor's house would fit perfectly. It's a very shiny together. globe. It is. <clears throat> or is that what just does that white paint on it? Hold on. Right? Doesn't mean they're not connected. Duh. My house and the neighbor's house would fit perfectly if you slid them together. First, uh, I don't think they would. Second, are they currently moving apart? Because if not, then there's no particularly good reason to think they were ever together. Third, do they show evidence other than just the fit of them having once been next to each other? Because, you know, we have things like um, geography that really only makes sense in terms of continental drift. In fact, that was in the map that Kent showed. <clears throat> there were organisms who had ranges that spread across continents in ways that don't make a whole lot of sense unless the continents were touching, because these weren't aquatic animals. These were terrestrial animals. We have terrestrial animals, one of which exists only in southern um, Africa, southern South America, and Australia. And then you have another one that only exists in northern South America and, like, central Africa. Then you have another one that only exists in, say, like, um, eastern North America, as well as North Africa. I mean, like, what are you supposed to take away from this? Because that's not how things are now. But why was that the case in the fossil record. You have to explain these things. And there is no fossil record. Oh, I forgot. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Except for uh, when Kent admitted to a fossil record, uh, I think an hour and four minutes or so into debate number three with King Kronka Duck. Yeah. Every <laughs> once in a while, I refer to my notes I have. What's Winters for $5 it's says? It's a cashmere effect. But Winters for AIG, sorry, for $5 says AIG is the bag of holding in an erotic TTRPG campaign. <laughs> Just don't put a portable hole in there. Funny. <clears throat> what does that prove? Nothing. Yes, Kent, that's true. It doesn't prove anything that you and your neighbor's house could roughly fit together. Good job. I'll that's probably why no one else talks about that. Mm hmm. Okay. The opposite sides of quite a few rivers would fit perfectly. Take, I mean, yeah. Take a look at the river, you know, same width, eh, follows the same curves. See? What does that prove, huh? The rivers change their widths. They do. Sometimes as they, you know, start from but start to finish. Also, but. are the two sides of the river currently expanding away from each other such that 
if you tied a string taut to two different poles on either side, it would eventually pull apart because of the spreading of the continent on which the river is? No? Okay then, Kent, what are we talking about? Because the thing is, the continents are currently spreading. That means in the past they were closer together. You combine that with the biogeographic information as well as the as well as the sedimentology that goes across continents. Nope, the guess continents what? were reversing back and forth. Oh, unlike like the magnetic, the magnetic field. field. Well, no, unlike because remember, the magnetic field right, didn't unlike reverse. Unlike the magnetic right, field, right? Obviously. Uh, you got it back, Stanford. John Rapp says, "I wonder how many Kent's brains could fit together into Kent's head." Uh, infinitely many, because Kent's brain has a dimension of zero. Nothing, all right? It doesn't prove the earth split open there and the river oozed up in between, all right? Yeah, that's true. I'll take a drink, I guess. But it's just a coincidence based Kent's on the water level. The shapes of the continents that it's we see today the is the a ground, pure coincidence up and the based... Shows up. I... What? Kent? I don't know. Did he on say wa- that? I think so. Water level. If you raise or lower the water just a few hundred feet, everything changes. Okay, but Kent, the continental shelf, which is where the continental crust, it's like the transition between continental and oceanic crust, right? Those are the thing that actually fit together pretty well. Like the actual crinkles on a map where the blue lines are, aren't the important bit in this, right? And everyone who studies this knows this. area of the uh, entire continent. Right, also irrelevant. The oceans average 12,000 feet deep. We were driving back last two days from Chicago. Ham- oh, Bliss Winters, welcome to Amnio on the channel membership program. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, guys, I think we're about, uh, I think we're like 18 members away from our next emoji. Once you hit 50, they instead of going up like a new emoji per five, pe- about five members, they just jump right up to 25. So... Now, is that emoji going to be a baby dinosaur with a diaper on? Uh, it might be that. It could also be a get bent emoji. I think yeah. there will be a poll on whether it's a, a, a dinosaur in a diaper, as suggested by the subject of my earlier video from today, or whether it will be a get bent emoji. Both great options. Dark Law Dragon, <laughs> who's been a member at the Tetrapod level for four months. Thank you for the support. Also, by the way, guys, get those Tetrapods in. To welcome Blitz Winters. Um, so Dra- Dark Law Dragon sends a, a milestone chat with all three of the Kaiju emojis. Godzilla, Mothra, and Ghidorah. So we'll take a drink. All right, here we go. Kent. I'm at Indiana, my family, and we had my little GPS sitting on the dash of the bus, you know, keeping track of how, where we are, how fast we're going, you know, in case we get lost. And it also shows elevation. Did you know Chicago is 600 feet above sea level? No, I still don't know it because I don't trust you to report that number, but I don't know why it matters. You know, we'll, we'll look it up. We'll look it up. We'll find out. Chicago elevation. 579 feet. That's close enough to 600. I'll give it to you, Kent. Sure, you were right. You were within one order of magnitude. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, here we go. <clears throat> 600 feet, you know, from here to building eight. That's it. And it's a long ways to the beach. From- oh, Boomer21 says, I love your one-sided debate. Why don't you try him one-on-one? I did. That was the debate where I got Kent Hoven, Dr. Dino, to admit that he doesn't know what a damn dinosaur is in the first place. So, thank you for that suggestion. I already took you up on that. Kent Hoven still, as far as I know, doesn't have that on his debate playlist to this day, whereas it's my fourth most watched video. There you go, Boomer21. I hope that satisfies your question, which ended with a period, which is weird, but whatever. Chicago. If the oceans, they're at 12,000 feet deep. If you raised them another 600 feet. Okay. What's that? Uh, 5%? Okay. As most people know, when you increase the radius of a sphere, which is what you have to do to increase the ocean level, the volume of the sphere goes up by the cube of the difference in the uh, radii. Do you think someone who taught high school math for 15 years would would know that? No. No. Well, he wouldn't. A normal person would. 
it's that weird subject geometro no Ge geology geometry geometry yeah it's not geomology no. <laughs> that's the fake one <laughs> you're thinking yeah. of astrology oh okay Actually, my, my brother once took an astrology course thinking it was an astronomy course. <laughs> he was very disappointed. <laughs> oh, man, you got to drop that class in the first week. <laughs> uh, this is such a weird intro to the class. Okay, I'll stick with it. Chicago would be underwater. Oh, oh Tesla Ranger Kent, oh. uh, Kent taught high school science and math. Oh. oh. So tell you what, Boomer. Or so he claims. Um. <clears throat> Since last time I asked Kent to uh, debate, he uh, wasn't interested unless I would be willing to dox myself. Uh, why don't you come and debate on this channel or maybe on the channel Chesh for Debate Hub? And um, Or if you don't want, really want to debate, we can have a nice, cordial conversation. Um, I know a number of people who'd be willing to host it. I know a number of people who'd be willing to moderate or even participate if instead of a structured debate, you just want to have a nice chat. So... Feel free. I have my public business email listed on my about page for the channel. Um, you can also find me on Twitter at dinosaur underscore dapper. And you can come and defend the honor of Kent Hovind as he failed to do in our first encounter and then chickened out of a second encounter unless he was able to uh, dox me. Oh, and Erica got sick given as well because we both wanted to chat with him, which I also have documented in another one of my, I believe, top five videos. Uh, Kent Hovind is a coward. Well, and then that would have been her, I think, second debate with him? Yep, because we both already she, debated him. She had already debated him. Now, at this point, well. I'm not going to debate a convicted uh, spouse abuser. I mean, that's that's where it is right now. Not yeah. again. Not again. Uh, not, especially not after he demands that I dox myself to come on, which, by the way, Boomer21, you don't have to do. I don't need to know your full name and address and your you know curriculum vitae or anything just to come on the channel and have a chat about evolution. Because um, I'm not a coward who has to dox people like Kent doxed AJ recently. Although you should vet your debate opponents because some of them might end up being young children. Yeah, I, I will probably require that we have at least one quick phone call before we actually go live. Just to make sure that you're not accidentally like me agreeing to debate like a 10-year-old. Because that did happen that one time and I regret it because I felt bad. Anyway, here we go. Oh, the United States would look a lot different. We cover more on that on video six, anyway, about the ocean. So yes, Kent, if the ocean rose six hundred feet, is about the ocean. I'm gonna take a drink because yeah, it is true that the United States would look a whole lot different if the oceans rose six hundred feet. Yeah, I don't think anyone would dispute that. This whole Pangea theory is dumb. We cover much more on that in seminar part six. Oh, there you go. It's just dumb. Okay. Uh, if you want to get, can't wait to get all that. You know what's dumb, one. Kent? You not wearing a tie. Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> look, at least he's not in the, the sort of Hawaiian shirt, but like, Kent, man, I know at this point in your life, you had a bunch of great ties because I've seen them. And like, look, I'm pretty critical of Kent, but he had some awesome ties. Ties I'm jealous of, honestly. It's, um, it's really not fair of me because like, I'm not wearing a tie. Yeah, but you're but not like, you're not known for your awesome ties. He was. That's true. That's true. That and a couple other things. Uh, hey, Boomer Twenty One. If you want to have have a, a discussion about the moon's orbit and its traveling away from the Earth in the past, shoot me an email or come contact me on dis on uh, not Discord, um, Twitter, and set up a discussion, man. I'm I'm not going to debate the comments right now. We're here to do Kent with Ben. Uh, if you want to do your own thing, where you come on and ask questions about evolution or the age of the Earth or astronomy or whatever, we can do that. <clears throat> We're just going to have to set that up as its own thing. Okay, the Earth is spinning. True. <laughs> Take a drink. About a thousand miles an hour at the equator. Uh, okay, so it's true that the equatorial tangential velocity of the Earth is about a thousand miles an hour. However... It's kind of silly to measure rotation in miles per hour. There's a reason that it's usually ro uh, measured in rotations per minute. Um, so, weird, but okay, sure, yeah, yeah. let's go full flurf, Kent, because it's not the first time you've gone full flurf. I think I think it's an an interesting way to think about it if you're not trying to be all scientific about it, like in 
Yeah, but the thing is, he is trying to be all scientific about I it. I know, I know, I know. I just, I don't. It's, mm. it is, it's interesting that there is a tang tangential velocity at the equator being faster than not at the equator because how of how um, math works in a spherical planet. Mm -hmm. Wait, is the Earth a planet or is it a star? And I forget if it's off to the right of the Milky Way or off to the left. Well, it depends. If you're the Jewish Matt Powell, then it's a star that's off to like the left of the Milky Way for whatever that means. And then if you're just a, a normal person? It's a planet that's in the Milky Way. Okay, that's what I thought. Technically, it's 1,041.6, I believe. You could... Sure, whatever. Take the diameter of the Earth divided young, by please, the 24 please, hours... Kids? Yeah. It takes to go around, you know. Who cares? But the Earth is spinning. We all know that. It's about 1,041 miles an hour at the equator. That would, even that would depend upon your altitude. I know somebody's going to call in and say, well, that depends if you're 80 feet above sea level or 800 feet. I understand. Kent, I don't think anyone's going to call in and say that because I don't think anyone cares. I people certainly don't. Might, people Damn, might. the circle's like, bigger. His maybe. fans might. His fans would. Yeah, might. maybe. That's true. They I might. taught geometry, but who cares? But the Earth yeah, is spinning. Taught, but the Earth is slowing you. down, okay? We're actually slowing down. In the Pensacola News Journal, about 15 years ago, they ran an article that said in 1990, this was just before New Year's Eve, you know, what, a couple of weeks before New Year's Eve, give 1990 one last tick before ushering in 1991. What's this all about? Well, Keep sucking. when you count off the final seconds of 1990, wait just an instant before cheering in 1991. By international agreement, an extra tick will be placed between 1990 in 1991 to keep regular clocks in line with atomic clocks. Atomic clocks are tuned to a particular quiver of the cesium atom and are accurate to a billionth of a second a day. But regular clocks use days as a measure which are growing longer by a thousandth of a second or more daily as Earth's rotation slows. The Earth is slowing down for several known reasons. Is okay? that evidence that Kent might be able to read? Um, yeah, actually. So to be fair, we have actually had questions as to whether or not Kent Hovind was literate because uh, he would put up on screen things that are legible that when he's trying to talk about the Big Bang. But um, further evidence, I think, has lent, led me to believe that he's probably literate. I think he's, I think he's literate. What does it mean? I don't know, man. I mean, look, I think he can read. He might have bad eyesight. He may not be the best reader, but he might not be the best writer because, you know, yeah. his thesis or dissertation or whatever he called it. If you look at the Earth, we're spinning toward the east. The crust of the Earth is solid rock, but only about 20 or 30 miles, which at this scale is about as thick as the paper on this globe, okay? 20 miles compared to oh, 8,000 so so is mm, 2 to 800, it. 1 to 400, Got it. okay? This is, what, a 12-inch globe, so 1 400th of the thickness of the radius would be the thickness of the crust of the Earth. Really not much. The Earth is about like... We were 21. It's on my About page. If you go to my channel page, uh, if, if any of my mods want to type in, or actually anyone, I guess, my, uh, my uh, email, it's... Uh, what is it? The dot dapper dot dinosaur dot yt at gmail dot com, um, but it's best to actually get it from the about page because then you can just copy paste it and you can be sure that that's the right email address because that's the one that I use for um, maintaining this channel with Google. I can, if you don't mind, I can just paste. Yeah, that's fine. The email address in the chat. A balloon would be a good <clears throat> analogy. The thickness of the rubber compared to the balloon is about how thick the crust is compared to the Earth. The inner part, as far as we know, oh, is nice. liquid. Kent just went live. Well, okay, Kent. It's not just liquid, right? So there's the mantle, which does have a viscosity. It's a viscosity that's a, several thousand times higher than the black top that forms a road surface. So think about just how liquidy your average road surface is. Then think about something that flows a thousand times less and then you're roughly at the viscosity of the upper mantle. I would call that a solid. If you could hold it in your hand without, you know, burning your hand off, it would just feel like a chunk of rock, right? Then below the mantle, so the mantle slowly gets more and more uh, fluid, less and less viscous as you go down. And then you get to the outer core, 
which is primarily liquid. But then you get to the inner core, which is once again, solid, primarily iron, bit of nickel, bit of other stuff. So it's not just the crust floating on a soupy liquid of, of magma. That's, that's not what's happening. In fact, the magma that you see flowing freely through like volcanoes in um, places like Hawaii is actually not primarily what the mantle is made of. Those are significantly lighter, lower melting point silicates. If I was spinning this thing and it was full of water, the liquid <clears throat> on the inside would create friction and quickly slow it down. We're talking like the, the fresh egg thing where you can spin an egg, you can see if it's hard boiled or not. Once you get the whole thing spinning, there is still a little problem with the, the movement of the liquid inside is going to be moving around as opposed to the surface, which is more rigid, the crust of the earth. So the liquid... Uh, okay, look, I don't know why we're going into all of this. It's, it basically all comes down to the interactions between the earth and the moon. The fact that the earth moon is moving away, as interestingly enough, our friend Boomer21 said uh, accurately, is what's taking the angular momentum away from the earth and adding it to the moon. In the long run, these interactions between the liquid parts and the solid parts of the earth are not actually doing anything here. Like, at least not any measurable thing. It's it's just the moon. So, but whatever. We'll, we'll talk about the liquid parts of the earth, I guess, for some reason. The center to the earth it somehow creates it leads a... to evolution, that's how. Yeah. I want to remind everyone, the topic of this is does the Bible match evolution? I, I don't know why that's the name of this. But, okay. Dr dragging Sorry. motion on the spinning. It doesn't, it gradually slows it down. Two other things enter into slowing the earth down. As the earth spins, the, the moon is pulling the water up, called the tide. Mm -hmm. Well, as the earth turns, that tidal bulge is constantly moving around the earth, okay? We're turning toward the east, so the tidal bulge is going toward the west. For instance, Penn Okay, but Kent, the water is moving on both sides of the bulge in opposite directions. So it evens out. There's no net pull on the Earth just from the tides of the water. Like, you're almost there, right? Because it is the tidal forces between the Earth and the Moon, but it's not because of the water tides. The water tides cancel out. I'm just going to take a drink and I'm going to pour another beer. And does not understand tides. <clears throat> well, you know, tide goes in. Tide goes out. Never a miscommunication. You can't explain that. Except, you know, yes. Yes, we can. We can actually explain it pretty easily with Kent this little thing called it. physics. I no, we can't believe can't. in psychics. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Actually, I saw a great cartoon about a psychic. Uh, I think yesterday. The cartoon is literally just a psychic... Um, going out to check the mail, finding there's nothing there, and then going back inside. Because why would you go to the mailbox if there's nothing there, if you're psychic? Mm. Pensacola's going to get the tide uh, a few minutes before a mobile gets it, gets the high tide, if all other factors are equal. The other things play into it here, like the shape of the topography of the land and all that, but who cares? Well, this tidal bulge, the tide washing up onto the beach, is a lot of water. It's heavy. You know, a gallon of water is 8 pounds, a cubic foot of water 64 pounds. You get a few thousand bazillion gallons of water smashing up on the beach. Even though it slowly comes up and, you know, goes back down, that tide, tidal bulge, creates a breaking action, slows the earth down. Except the, there's, a, I guess, an anti-bulge between the two bulges, which are on opposite sides, canceling all the net effects out. <clears throat> this is... Uh, I just don't get it. Or whatever, we'll keep going. The third factor that slows the Earth down is prevailing wind currents. Because the Earth is turning, hot air rises, so the air near the equator tends to go up. The sailing ships discovered this the hard way, as they're trying to sail that back... hot air rises, but only because the Earth is spinning? Because I feel like I, that's what he said. I think that might be... Let's, well, let's go back a second and see if that's what he said the earth down is prevailing wind currents i like how his three reasons none of them are the actual reason which is already a thing he accepts that the earth is exchanging angular momentum with the moon 
Because okay. the earth is turning, um, hot air rises. Oh my goodness. Hot air rises because the earth is turning, guys. I'm going to take a drink. And then we're going to go over the basics of convection. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, so hot air rises because as air heats up, the average distance between the atoms and molecules making up the air increases. Really, the molecules aren't very many single atoms. <clears throat> there are of like the noble gases, but they're trace elements at best. So we'll just ignore them for now. Molecules or smaller, as Kent has said. <laughs> so <clears throat> that means that the density of that air has gone down because what's density? It's units of mass divided by units of volume. If the space between the molecules goes up, there are fewer molecules per unit volume, thereby density has gone down. Now, the buoyant force <clears throat> acts more strongly on less dense things than on more dense things because the amount of displacement is higher, so it's stronger force because the buoyant force scales up with volume. Okay, so for the same unit of um, mass, the buoyant force is now higher for the less dense air. Therefore, it goes up. Now, conversely, <clears throat> as it's cooling down up in the atmosphere, it's condensing, which means the buoyant force acts less, so the air falls down. Now, <clears throat> which part of this uh, did I have to talk about rotating frames of reference in order to explain convection? The none part. The none part, right. That's because your frame of reference doesn't have to be rotating for convection to occur. It has nothing to do with it. Huh. Convection cells would exist on a non-rotating Earth. Now, they'd be a little bit different because there would, the subsolar point wouldn't move, and so Earth's heating wouldn't be even across the equator. But, like, the fact that convection occurs on Earth has nothing to do with the rotation of the Earth. So the air near the equator tends to go up. The sailing ships discovered this the hard way. As they're trying to sail back in the 1500s, you know, Columbus, 1492, sailed the ocean blue. As they tried to sail across the... Columbus, who didn't go across the equator, yeah, go on. The ocean, pretty soon they went, started to go across the equator. Let's go to South America. We'll see what they got down there. Let's steal, steal their gold, you know. I mean... Yeah, that is, you know what, I'll, I'll give it to you, Ken. That was a big part of sailing across the equator was, let's go steal their gold. That's, you know what, that, that might be the thing that he said that I agree with the most tonight. Yeah, that was a pretty big motivation. Let's go steal some other people's gold. Surprisingly woke take for Kent. Yeah. I, I did not expect Kent to come out like anti-colonialism, but hey, you know what, good on you, Kent. Every once in a while, you get that surprise and they get that little dopamine release. Yeah. That's why we're here. I appreciate it. So, as they started, when they got to the equator, the wind quit blowing. Yeah, it's called the doldrums. The wind is blowing just fine until all of a sudden they get to the equator. Okay, so here's the thing, right? There are other doldrum areas on the Earth besides that because the Earth isn't just divided <clears throat> sorry, into two convection cells, right? I don't remember how many it is. We have, probably have to have Maddie to tell us because, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but Maddie studies like climate science, so she knows about this stuff. I less so, but um, it, it is the case that there are doldrums around the equator, also other places, so it's not quite the case to say that the wind is fine everywhere, but whatever. It's and it just the major, the major Sales went flat. Oh, did you? Um, in college, like freshman hmm. year, I had to know him for one exam, but I forgot about that. Weird. What? Oh, okay, sure. It was it was one of my first one of my general bio classes. Okay. And they're stuck. It's called the doldrums. D o. Oh, hey, that's what I said. O l doldrums. But also in the same drink for him, spelling it d o l doldrums. Uh, okay. Maybe he was trying to. They make hit a this. Joke. Did we laugh? Did no. We no, I don't know. This area, and it's like, wow, what do we do now? Get out the oars. Let's row this, you know, 20 bazillion pound boat for the next 300 miles. Uh, are the doldrums 300 miles across? Let's, uh, let's find out. 
Like, I feel like it's not, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, let's see. I'm actually okay with not knowing. Because, like, if he gets that wrong, eh. I mean, I'm a little curious. Um, let's see. Well, yeah, you gotta look it up now. <clears throat> Two instance. You know what? So, this doesn't have an exact measurement, but, like, looking at it, 300 miles actually does not seem like... It, it's certainly not his normal four to six orders of magnitude off, so I'll, I'll just go with it. It was a real problem until they discovered there are some currents they can ride to get across here. But in the days of sailing ships... Five degrees north to five degrees south of the equator. Hmm. It was a real problem. If you don't have wind, you're stuck. And you got a real problem on your hands. The reason... That's true. Big sailing vessels are indeed in a big problem if they don't have wind or a current. I'll take a drink. And it was because the air is going straight up. The wind was blowing all right, straight up, which doesn't do you any good. Um, so... Sitting there, you're probably not going to notice a whole lot of upward wind, but whatever, it's fine. What if your boat morphs into a helicopter right at that exact spot? Maybe it would help. <laughs> that might help if that happened. You ever think of that, Kent? Mm. Oh, Carrie Bronson said, wait, is he about to argue that the mantle convection should have doldrums? I don't know. That would be interesting. Use that for sails. At the North Pole... It cold air sinks, so the cold air was dropping down. Okay, but Kent, like I said, there aren't two convective cells on Earth. <laughs> please, please don't say that there are only two convection convection cells in Earth's atmosphere. Please don't. He'll say three because of the South Pole, too. Uh, but that would still only be two. <laughs> You'd open your freezer, you know, and the cold air rushes out to the floor. Yeah. Hot air rises, drink. expands, cold air sinks. So if there were no other factors involved, the hot air would rise off the equator, drift over to the poles, sink at the poles, the air would blow along the surface of the Earth toward the equator, rise up, make a great big loop. Okay, he's saying if there were no other factors. I'm, I'm thinking he might say that because the Earth spins, we get more than one convection cell, which is true. That is true. That is why we have more than one. Convection on its own doesn't depend on spin, but the number of convection cells does. So, I'm crossing my fingers that he's going to get this right. Because I really want him to. I don't think he will. Alright, well, well, we'll see. The I mean, problem is it can't I quite make it get that far. So it actually it's divided up into three loops called the Coriolis effect. We're gonna... Oh, you were so close, Kent! Uh, but you know what? I'm going to take that as a confirmed prediction that, yeah, he, he doesn't actually think there are only two solar cell or uh, convection cells, which is true. Okay. Into more of that later, but these, this wind is generally in Pensacola. The okay, so it's not, it's not called the Coriolis effect. It doesn't have to do with Coriolis effects. So he's, he's less wrong than he could be, basically. The wind blows the same direction. You can watch the weatherman, you know, he says, oh, here come the storms, you know, and typical based on the season, the rain or the wind is always coming from the northwest, or other seasons is always coming weather from man, the weatherman, that's what I would say. Oh, here come the storms. Just how I would say it. I would, I would watch you say why that not? as a weatherman. Because why not? Maybe you should be a weatherman. Oh, man, I'd be a great weatherman. Yeah. You got to do it just like, like uh, the guy from uh, Anchorman, though. I mean, like... Now, here in the Middle East, as you're right. pointing to a map of the United States. And then pointing to the Midwest, calling it the Middle East. Southeast, you know. But these prevailing wind currents create it. They, they slow the Earth down just a little tiny. No, no, they don't. Because, again, this is another example where the net effect cancels out as you go across convection cells on either side of the never, equator. I have never heard that claim that. The winds are what's slowing the Earth down. It's because they're not. On net, they rotate at about the same speed as the, the surface of the Earth. It's just locally that there are winds. On net, it comes out to essentially be zero. And the thing is, Kent already knows of the thing that causes the actual slowing. It's the exchange of angular momentum between the Earth and the Moon. I feel like he said that in a previous Kent with Bent episode. Did he not say that? Or he said something he, about that. But I know that he's mentioned angular momentum in this discussion mm -hmm. about whether or not the Bible and evolution are... He, he knows what angular momentum is. He's approximately right about it. He knows the Earth is receding. Or sorry, the moon is receding from the Earth. 
which I guess from the moon's perspective is the Earth receding. Uh, whatever. Um, like he could be getting this right. He doesn't have to be dumb about it, but he chooses to be. And that's the thing about it, right? Like, it's not yeah, just yeah. that Kent has low intelligence. I have no idea if he does or not. He actively chooses to get things wrong by either not caring or intentionally deciding it would be better for him to get them wrong. I don't well, know exactly what it is. And then get a thing wrong as he knows if he gets it right, his conclusion is wrong. Right. And so that's what I, when, when I say that Kent is stupid or dumb, I don't mean that he's unintelligent. I mean that he consciously makes choices that lead him to the wrong answer when he could not. If Kent were just legitimately unintelligent, then I wouldn't really care, right? I'd just be like, all right, well, you know, people have different levels of intelligence, and it's not like a, I can't judge someone for not being intelligent. Like, that's, like, whatever, it's fine. But I, I don't think that's the case. Kent makes choices that lead him to these stupid takes. It's not that he's dumb. He's willfully dumb. As he's Robert willful. Madewell says, will for, willfully ignorant. He has to uh, turn off the parts of his brain that let him really be open-minded about anything he's looking into. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, look, you, you should know better if you're Kent that you should know better on how to do research. It's not just going to your favorite creationist person and asking their opinion on it. It's looking at multiple sources and getting an actual objective answer. Yeah. As much as you possibly can. <clears throat> At least trying to. It's about intellectual honesty and mm -hmm. his lack of it. Yep. All right, here we go. A bit. Not much, but it, you know, it's like the wind blowing on your car. You get up to a certain speed. It's 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 miles an hour. The wind starts to be... Oh. Um, Grant says that he's having trouble hearing both me and you. I'm looking at uh, the audio levels, and I'm seeing it is okay. Is it particularly noisy? I can try to fix that. That sounds good to me when I unmute. Huh. Um, Turn your speakers off and on again. I don't know. Sorry, uh, if anyone else is having a big problem with that, let me know. <clears throat> Chesh says it sounds fine. All right, well, uh, I don't know. Become a factor, and you start to lose gas mileage because there's so much wind friction to overcome. Well, the wind on the mountains isn't anything like that, but it's enough to slow the earth down. So the three... No, it's not, because the prevailing wind directions alternate across the um, the various convection cells, and it, it just cancels out. It's just not a net effect on the earth. The factors are the internal liquid core, the tide, and the prevailing wind currents. I... I hate it so much that he knows the right answer to this. He talks about it all the time, and he can't get it this time. I'm taking a drink. Not convenient to be correct right now. All of those act as a break to slow the Earth down. That's been known for a long time, and it's been known that the Earth is slowing down. It would have to be slowing down, which raises a couple of questions. How fast can it keep this up? How long can it keep this up, I mean? At what I mean, at a certain point, it'll just tidally lock with the moon. But that's in, like, longer than the Earth-Moon system is likely to ex exist, so, you know. So then it won't, because it won't be able to. Right. I, like, that's where it's trending, but it won't be able to get there, because the sun will explode before then, so not, not really a concern. At what point will it slow down to a dead stop? It, it won't, because it would be, like, several billion years after the sun explodes. Oh, with a, with a ball this big what is and this he, heavy? I mean, look... In relation to the Earth-Moon system, is that what he's talking about? When would the Earth stop spinning? Maybe he means Earth-Sun, because it won't do that. Because all of this is relative, right? If you're talking about the yeah. Earth-Sun, the Earth won't be tidally locked with the Sun, as far as I know. I haven't heard that. It's not close enough or large enough at its distance. <clears throat> um... So, uh, Andrew Cummings says the sun will not explode. I mean, it's a matter of exactly what you mean. It will shrink into a white dwarf in terms of its core, but also the outer material will puff away, leaving a planetary nebula, which is a mass ejection of gas and dust, which, I don't know, does that count as an explosion? Like, it's, it's a relative term. 
I say, yeah, sure, why not? But if you disagree with me, I'm not going to say you're wrong. Most of the Sun's mass will leave before and not form the core of the White Dwarf. And it will do it fairly rapidly. So, I don't know. Does that count as an explosion? I mean... Doesn't it, doesn't it take thousands of years or whatever to do it? <clears throat> yeah, but the solar system is also a really big place. If you were standing there, you'd probably not be having fun with it. Yeah. But relatively rapidly. Yeah. Versus, like, a supernova. Yeah. I mean, look, like I said, that's why I said, like, if you want to say that that's not an explosion, I'm not going to argue with you. It's fine. I, I don't think that there's a hard cutoff as to what counts as an explosion and what doesn't. If you say that's too slow for your definition, then okay, that's fine. Well, well, what about the air in space, though? How does it make the <laughs> how does it affect the fire of the hey, sun? This isn't Matt with Maddie. <laughs> I'm All allowed right. to make references. I to know. <laughs> I know. All right, here we go. <clears throat> I mean, Earth weighs like six sextillion tons. It's going to take a long time. Yeah. Then why is it a long time space to slow it down? Falling, huh? Um. Yeah. Well, Smitty says. If, is evaporation an explosion? Yeah, if it happens fast enough. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, I I don't know where to draw the line. And if you say that that line should be drawn somewhere else, then okay, that's, I that's fine. I think Nova or Supernova is where I would draw it. But like, all right. It doesn't really matter that much to me. I mean, I'm not writing scientific papers about it or anything like that. So. Yeah. And look, I, I get it. I, that that process is probably slower than most people would count as an explosion, and I'm probably being uh, intentionally dramatic when I say that it is. So yeah, it's it's all relative. It is an expansion of the look. Some will get much larger. I think twice actually, but and then yeah, the rest of the stuff goes away, and then you've got your little core. Yeah, but yeah, it's true. It will take a lot longer than any one person will live. Yeah. And you could argue that that expansion is slow enough to not call an explosion, which, yeah, that's fair. But again, it's a continuum problem. There's no, like, cut-off line for when an explosion happens versus doesn't based on timeline. But yeah, I will agree. It is not what most people would call an explosion in terms of time scale. So, yeah, that's fair. To stop it. But, obviously, quite obviously, it used to be going faster. Yes. Take a drink. Yeah, that was true. Take a drink. Well, if the Earth was going faster, mm -hmm. you start to create a problem. Oh. Here's Astronomy Magazine, June of 92. They said, Earth's rotation is slowing down. To compensate for this lagging motion, June will be one second longer than normal. Oh. This leap second announced by the International Earth Rotation Service in February will keep calendar time in close alignment with international time. Oh, yeah, Tesla Ranger points out iron rusting is a slow burn. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things, right? Um, humans like to give processes very different names depending on how fast they happen relative to a human like lifespan. But fundamentally, they're kind of the same process in a lot of cases. So, like, is iron on fire? Well, no, not by most people's definition. But it's also undergoing the same basic kind of uh, like chemical reaction that wood is undergoing when it's on fire. So, like... Is it just a really cold, really slow fire? And you could say, well, is there ionization happening? I could say, well, no. And then you could say, well, maybe that's the definition of fire. And like, okay, well, then is it the same thing as like when embers slowly burn away, but there isn't ionization? Maybe. Maybe it's the same thing as uh, coal embers. Um, I don't know. Just don't try to cook by rapidly rusting iron. It's not going to work. Because of the slowing earth, eventually a day is no longer... 24 hours. Yeah, it's a thousand years, right? Is that how that works? A day is a thousand years. So here, here's the thing, right? <clears throat> uh, the hours are basically defined by the average length of the solar day. So <clears throat> what actually happens is not that the day is no longer 24 hours. It's that the length of the hour changes. Now, recently, we've redefined hours in terms of seconds and seconds in terms of the vibration of cesium atom stuff. So, but historically... I mentioned, right? Uh, uh, yeah, we did. Historically, though, the hour has been defined by the average length of a solar day. So, for most of history, at least, what an hour is has changed, not the number of hours per day. Also, historically, <coughs> sorry, I'm a little cough there. Um, also, historically, uh, hours have not always been the same length as each other. There were always 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night. And in the summer, 
the daylight hours were longer than the nighttime hours. So, turns out that what an hour is is weird and complicated. Now it's slightly longer because the Earth's going slower. They've had leap seconds since uh, 1973. Usually, they used to do it every year, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, and then they started going uh, half a year, six months, or no, a year and a half. We can read. Yeah. We can read. Thank you. Sometimes it's, you know, July, 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 and then January, 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 about every year to year and a half, somewhere in there. We have to add a second to the clock. People say, who cares? What? Well, if the Earth's yes. only 6,000 okay. years old, okay. that really is not a big deal. That's true. That would be 6,000 seconds of difference. So what, what is that? So let's see. A that year is, a year is, let's say 365.25 uh, times 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. So that comes out to a year is 31,557,600 seconds. So yeah, you add 6,000 seconds to that and that's like less than a percent to change. That's 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 fair. Adam's day was probably just a little bit shorter, actually, because the Earth was spinning just a little bit faster. Adam wouldn't notice. He didn't have a watch, as far as we know. So you people that like to sleep in, hey, rejoice. You know, your day's probably a second or two longer than Adam's was. Mm -hmm. You probably got more time to sleep. <laughs> okay. oh, Big deal. But if you want to go back millions of years, you're going to really create a problem in a hurry. Yeah, you would actually if you kept this linear, but um, <clears throat> we actually have ways to uh, measure the length of a day because there are certain things in the geological column that leave both daily and annual layers and we can distinguish between them. So for instance, <clears throat> uh, coral has a both daily and an annual growth pattern. And you can look at how many daily growth patterns occur within an annual growth pattern. And it turns out that, you know, way back at the beginning of, say, the Phanerozoic, the day was a lot shorter. I think it was about 16 hours or so, based on our current hours. And maybe back during, like, the beginning of the Hadean, it was as short as, you know, like, under 10 hours. But the thing is, that also means that we can actually trace like a graph of how rapidly the slow has occurred. And it turns out that this Earth was slowing slower in the past than it is now, and that that rate has not actually just had a smooth mathematically uh, determined rate because the exchange of angular momentum between the Earth and the Moon, which is the actual cause of this, not the nonsense causes that Kent Hovind says, that right there depends in part on the arrangement of the continents. And right now, the continents being fairly spread apart, which is fairly unusual for Earth, actually makes that exchange happen more rapidly. Whereas the continents being closer together, which has been the more typical situation for Earth's history, makes that happen more slowly. So, yeah. It's another instance of Kent saying, oh, hey, whenever extrapolating something back into the past is a bad idea, I'm going to do that. Whenever it's a good idea, I'm not going to do that. Kent always does the opposite with extrapolating processes into the past. Whenever we oh, know we, we to, can't, well, yeah. To get his conclusions. Yeah, whenever we know that extrapolating an, a, a trend infinitely into the past is a dumb thing to do, it's what Kent chooses to do. Whenever we know that it's a good thing to do, it's a good idea, we can do it, Kent does the opposite. And my goodness, Caleb Sherstad for 100 US says, so this will be my last chat for a while as I'm moving to Germany. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and the oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength with the AIG bag of giggle sticks. That is amazing. Thank you for the extremely generous super chat, Caleb. I really, I, I can't say how much I appreciate that. It's well done. <clears throat> My goodness. Um, all right, we're going to get a little bit more Kent in, and then we're going to wrap it up. And we're going to give some, some channel announcements and, uh, then we'll be out of here for the night. Millions of years ago, the Earth would have been going real fast. These are those loops I was telling you about, the prevailing wind current. It's called the Coriolis effect. It's not called the Coriolis effect. It is a result of the Coriolis effect, but it's not called that. And I hate this so much. Just take another drink. I can't. It's 
called the Coriolis effect theory. Oh, it's like the Pangea theory. <laughs> it's just a theory. And I don't even believe it. That just looks like lines on paper to me anyway. Yeah. Because the hot air rises, cold air sinks, and because the Earth turns, the air, the loops, instead of just going straight toward the equator, they kind of go at an angle. That, that's why. Yes, Ken, that is it. You got it, man. I am so happy he got there. I'm going to take a drink for him getting that right. I cannot express how happy it makes me that he got that bit right, because uh, it's such a struggle with Kent. That's why the prevailing wind currents usually are out of, out of the northeast or out of the northwest, depending mm -hmm. on your latitude. Yes. But same thing. We're not going to drink for it. Yes, Kent. That is correct. You did figure it out. You get up above a certain latitude and the wind currents change. Mm -hmm. yep. There's another place where the air is dropping straight down. So the sailboats have a hard time going through there because the wind is you know, coming down instead of out. Yeah, that's, that's a slightly different thing. We'll, we'll drink for that being right. But yeah. That's true. Uh, I'm impressed. Tyler West says, let's ha see how he screws it up. Man, don't jinx it. You Once you get to a certain line, you lose all your wind. Your sails go flat. And you're stuck again. Get out the oars, you know? Or, you know, the currents. But yeah, sure, whatever. It's fine. Or lash onto a whale. Let him pull you across. Um, if the Earth is only 6,000 years old, it's not a problem. If you go back millions of years, you create a problem. Not really, but go on. I tell kids, you know, if you think dinosaurs lived 200 million years ago, I know what happened to them. They got blown off. Now, actually, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't even know what to say. Um, sure, yeah, you know what? I, I'm not going to do it now. But if anyone wants to put in the comments the math for getting the um, was it centrifugal force? at the equator to equal or exceed the gravitational force, like how fast would the Earth have to spin? Please, let me know. I would find that fascinating. I believe it's all just an algebra. Like, I don't think you have to do any, like, calculus or anything. So, um, yeah, please let me know if you do that, because that would be a fun thing to find out. Um, so, let's see. Oh, Burmer21 says the Earth is actually speeding up. Um, that's going to be uh, something that I would need a citation for. Because um, I'm in agreement with I'm in agreement with Kent that it's it's definitely slowing down, which is not something I say very often. And I'm in agreement with Kent, <clears throat> but um, it's interesting to hear you take a different take from his. Uh, so guys, we're gonna do some quick wrap up stuff. Bent, get anything you want to plug? No. Okay. Um, let's take a look. So <clears throat> I believe. The 6th is an off day for Power Ranger Jungle Beasts, so I don't think we're playing on the 6th. Um, also, we're not doing Guns, Magic, and Steel because that is on a bit of a hiatus. We will be back on the 20th um, for a boss fight, and then we will be off again for a little while. Uh, we're going to basically be scrambling to make sure that everyone can be there for the 20th for the boss fight. Then we're going to be off for a certain period of time while, uh, you know, like Erica does stuff like live in Kenya for a while. Which makes it hard to get everyone together. So um, there will be a, a sort of like a, a current arc climax on the 20th. It'll be over on Chesh's channel. Um, on the, <coughs> sorry, on the 7th, I will be doing, uh, what will be premiering is the next episode of Pastor Can't Understand Science. Uh, about Pete Greer. And he will be misunderstanding something else this time. I don't remember exactly what. Uh, on the 9th, I'm hoping for a Leaving Young Earth creationist, Leaving Young Earth Creationism. There you go. Uh, I need to talk with my potential guest about that and see if uh, that is actually something that they are, in fact, willing to do. We had a, a little discussion about it earlier, but um, I don't want to spring it on them. I'm like, oh, hey, you're definitely showing up for this, right? Uh, if it's not leaving our Earth creationism, it'll probably just be another Dapper Reacts to things. Um, Tuesday the 12th. Now, this would normally be Eric with Erica, but Erica, like we said, and like she said, is uh, going to Kenya for a while. So she will probably not be around until next month for a um, Eric with Erica, which means that currently we're planning on doing Kent with Bent 87 on that Tuesday. Then the 13th, should be um, 
a Power Ranger Jungle Beast on my Top Hats Off channel if you like to watch actual play of an RPG. Um, as you might know, there was some awkwardness last time, and I think it's resolved, but I am going to pull my players and see if they want to either take the week off, play, or maybe just do a one-shot from another game just to kind of settle down a little bit. Um, so, I mean, stay tuned there, right? Uh, the 14th is going to be part three of Pastor Can't Understand Science. And then the 16th, who knows, right? Um, and then, of course, for the Tuesdays, 19th should be Matt with Maddie, and the 26th should be Jackson with Jackson. Um, and I think that's basically it for channel announcements. Any last thoughts there? All of my thoughts are gone. <clears throat> I know how that feels. All right, guys. I'm just, I'm just focused on why Ken can't talk about his topic. That's it. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, also, DM Wing, sorry, for $10, sent a bunch of money emojis with a dapper emoji, because uh, the dapper emoji is super cool. And um, there you go. Thank you very much, everybody. I will talk to you, hopefully, on Thursday. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Bent Hovind, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Landon Knoll, Yepetus, Mavity Babity, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. The people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wish list, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.